Okay, I, I wonder if if um, I can start. Hopefully, if anyone's still to to join us, they can they can um, tune in as we as we proceed. Um, so, hello everyone, and, and and welcome to to this e EPRC uh, webinar. Um, my name is Martin Ferry. I'm a researcher at the European Policies Research Centre. Uh, with a specific interest in the urban dimension of regional policy. Um, today we're, we're pleased to, to have the opportunity for discussion of the Glasgow City Region deal um, with different perspectives on the experience of implementation to date and prospects for, for the future. I think this is an opportune moment for reflection on the role of the deal in steering um, investment in the area uh, including in the broader context of Brexit, but also, of course, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, before I introduce our, our presenters, uh, I'm sure people are familiar with the protocol for, for Zoom meetings, um, maybe more familiar than you would like. But um, just a reminder um, to keep your microphone muted um, if you're not speaking, to use the blue hand on the Zoom function to raise um, uh, a point or make an intervention um, or feel free to use the chat function to send questions or comments too. I'd also like to point out that the webinar is being recorded and we'll make a link available. So I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Um, Rebecca Hackett, who's Deputy Director uh, head of, and Head of Policy Division in the UK Government in Scotland. She particularly focuses on improving communication and policy coordination um, in the areas of trade, industrial strategy and economic analysis, and she leads on the programme of city deals. We also have Richard, uh, Richard Cairns, Strategic Director for Regeneration at West Dumbartonshire Council. Um, should mention that last year they won the RICS award for the best regeneration project in, in Britain. Um, he chairs the Glasgow City Region Economic Intelligence Steering Group and, and, and is a visiting expert at the School of Public Policy here at the University of Strath Strathclyde. Um, I propose the following format for the meeting. Um, first for Rebecca and then Richard to give their presentations, maybe 15 to 20 minutes each. And after this, we'll open up the meeting um, for further discussions uh, for where participants, as I said, as I said can can indicate if they want to make an intervention. Okay, uh, without further ado, can I hand over to, to Rebecca uh, to begin with her presentation. Thanks, Rebecca. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for, for hosting this and for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the UK government's overall city region deal programme in, in Scotland and how that looks at a macro level. And then I'll talk a little bit more um, in the second half about the, the Glasgow deal specifically, um, which Richard will, will come on to focus on. Um, so I think as you as you probably are aware the the city region deals in Scotland um, invest in projects that drive regional economic growth and create jobs so the the aim is to to support local economies um, and invest in projects co that can really um, transform um, transform their economies and support um, local employment so that that's been the the focus of the investments um, and from a UK government perspective um, there's been a particular um, focus on reserved areas of responsibility so so many of our investments have been in areas around um, research and innovation and um, digital economy and um, connectivity so I'll talk a little bit more more detail about about that and I suppose how how the Glasgow deal is different to some of the other deals that we have in place in Scotland so the um, the deals are agreements between the UK government the Scottish government and local partners um, so that tripartite arrangement um, is is really important that's you know that's really at the um, at the core of what we're doing um, and and that's you know that's something that that started with the the Glasgow Clyde Valley deal, but has um, has continued throughout the other the other deals. And I think the um, you know the the partnership between UK government, um, Scottish government, and other partners um, is is really at the core of what we're doing. Um, apologies, I'm struggling to uh, 
move the screen so I can see the uh, the slides properly. So I'm just going to open the slides on uh, on my own computer to uh, to help that. So as I said, the uh, the collaborative working is. Um, is really the most important um, element from our perspective and I think that's something that's that's probably quite new in the kind of post devolution era um, I think the you know the the UK government has has been working with local partners but this has really taken that down to a um, I suppose a more granular level and a, and a kind of project level and I think that's you know that's really helpful in bringing together the devolved and reserved and local responsibilities and making sure that that locally driven um, economic strategy is able to be supported by both governments um, so that you know that kind of bottom-up approach has been at the core um, of what we've been doing um, with the governments playing a playing a supportive role and and you know the funding being a collaborative element as well so as I said previously the um, you know, each government is is generally responsible for funding in in the areas of its own responsibility. So, um, UK government um, focusing in um, research and innovation, digital. Um, Scottish government has has focused more on transport, infrastructure, skills, and education. But as you'll you'll come on to hear, the Glasgow deal um, was was one of the first deals, and there's been a bit more flexibility in how that's been delivered at a local level. So we haven't seen quite that kind of partition that we've had in later deals in terms of which which government has funded which projects. Um, we work very closely in partnership with the Scottish Government in managing the programme. So, so it really is a, a joint endeavour between the two governments and that kind of flows down from the from you know regular meetings at the political level to a range of um, formal um, processes between both governments to, um, to make sure that we're, we're monitoring and evaluating the programme, resolving issues um, and working closely with local partners in terms of um, responding to, to challenges and, and needs. So I think, um, you know, we've seen that uh, increase in intensity, particularly over the over the past number of weeks and months with the with the COVID crisis. We've had a lot of discussions with deals that are in delivery and anticipated to, to come on stream in terms of what, you know, what the impact of the COVID crisis is, what, what challenges that's causing or opportunities potentially at a local level and how both governments can work to uh, to support that. The the Scotland office or the office of the Secretary of State for Scotland as we're now known is um, is in the lead in, in these discussions at a local level but we are connecting back into the rest of Whitehall so the departments that we work most closely with are the Treasury and Ministry for Housing Communities and Local Government and they're both built into these um, governance structures at the UK government end and then we are working across Whitehall departments to, to draw in their expertise because we're actually a tiny department ourselves we're only about 80 officials um, covering a, a very wide range of activity so we we're pulling in Whitehall departments to, to give us their view on the project proposals that are coming from local partners so DCMS and um, Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy in particular um, giving their view and, and working through business cases with partners so the um, the process for agreeing a deal um, I mean Glasgow was the first and that was done in quite a, a unique um, way which I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to discuss but it was it was quite an accelerated time frame and it was it was done um, you know very very quickly and um, in in coordination with a number of other deals that were happening across the UK at the same time this has kind of evolved a, in a process um, across the UK, uh, well, sorry, across Scotland, so that deals in other parts of the country um, have followed, but that wasn't necessarily the, um, the aim at the outset of the programme. It's, it's kind of evolved it more organically, we might say. So the key, the key elements, um, you know, we announced that we'll do a deal and that's, that's the case for, for all parts of Scotland now. Both governments have committed to, to making sure that there's a deal in place across the country. Um, in more recent stages, we've tended to announce how large um, the deal will be at, a, at an earlier stage, just to give local partners a sense of the, um, I suppose, to manage expectations and give a sense of, of what 
partners should be aiming for in developing their project proposals. So originally we, we were taking a kind of bottom up approach where, where no quantum would be set at the outset, but we found that that could be quite challenging in terms of giving partners, um, you know, some expectations of, of what their, um, what their kind of range of expected funding would be. Um, heads of terms is the um, is the next key stage, and that's where both both governments come together with local partners and are really spelling out in um, in a fair level of detail the the projects that we're anticipating funding within the deal, and then the full deal agreement um, being put in place where the the projects have gone through a, a degree more um, more review and all of the necessary governance and, and financial structures have been put in place to to turn the kind of collection of projects into a program for delivery now in the case of um glasgow the the partners have had that um had that control in terms of where the funding should be spent so i think this is something that i'm sure richard will come come to talk more about because unfortunately i wasn't actually involved at the point that the glasgow deal was um was agreed but whereas for for subsequent deals each government has allocated funding to specific projects. In the case of Glasgow, the partners were given full, full autonomy in terms of um, selecting the projects. So, so that's been quite a, quite a different character for the Glasgow deal. And it's required quite different local structures to, um, to put that process in place. So I think, um, just to give you a sense of of the scale of the program and um and what the what the program has achieved i mean i think it's it's really um from our perspective a very strong opportunity for us to work at a more local level in scotland and, and engage with local partners and give those partners an opportunity to to link into uk government thinking on on key areas of reserved responsibility so we know that the uk government departments you know they can be feel quite distant um from from local communities in scotland and this has provided provided more connection as well as obviously leveraging in additional funding so i think these are these are projects that would have would have struggled um in many cases to to find that funding if it hadn't been for the the city deals opportunity and we've been able to bring both governments funding together in a in a joined up way driven by local partners and then local partners have been able to to leverage in other other sources of funding and then probably a little bit less so in the in the case of, of Glasgow but the um, you know higher education sector for example has been a really important um, source of, of input for many of the deals in Scotland and I think they've they've had quite different characteristics as, as we look around the country in terms of where the driving force has been so you know for example in, in Aberdeen and in the northeast the, the the kind of oil and gas industry played a very strong role in kind of driving forward that deal but the the character has responded to the local local needs but also the local kind of institutions and, and driving forces. Um, so the programme is 1.4 billion um, at this point. The funding is, is stretching over a range of periods. So the Glasgow deal is over a 20 year period, some are over a 15 year period, and then some are over a 10 year period. So I think there's, you know, there's been some evolution in, in the approach in terms of the, uh, the length of funding as well. And as I said, we've got, um, we've got deals in place across all of the, the cities and we've got um, increasingly working to, to cover the rural areas of Scotland as well uh, with Borderlands and, and Murray and Ayrshire and we're, we're working um, to try and complete the, complete the picture with Falkirk and the islands and Argyll and Butte still to come. So, as I said, the, um, the Glasgow deal is a bit different to, to the other deals in Scotland. So it's this gain share um, is, is the description for it. And that there were a series of, of 10 similar funds across England and Wales, which were agreed at the same time. Um, so local authorities have really been in the, in the driving force. And you've got the eight local authorities across the Glasgow and Clyde Valley involved in, um, in negotiating the deal and then, and then implementing it. 
So it was agreed in um, 2014 and the, the quantum was, um, you know, it was very sizable. I think it's, you know, it is one of the, well, it is the biggest deal in Scotland and it's, um, you know, it was a, a significant um, chunk of investment from both governments and, and local partners bringing in their own resources as well. So as I said, it's over a 20 year period. We have a more formal review process built into this deal than some of the other ones. So um, these formal um, five year gateway reviews, which are a kind of gateway to unlocking further funding. So we just went through that process um, with Glasgow earlier this year. So there was you know, a lot of independent evaluation um, commissioned as part of that process. It was done, um, a similar process was carried out across all of the um, gain share deals at the same time. And we worked closely with, with Glasgow partners to, you know, to evaluate how, how progress was going and, and what issues there were. And, and both governments were, were happy um, happy to sign off the, the continued funding and, and confident that, that good progress was being made in implementing the deal. Richard will talk more about the, the details of the deal and the, um, the content, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the, the key areas of, of funding for the deal are innovation and growth, labour market and infrastructure. Um, so the local partners have, have put together a really wide ranging um, package of measures which are now, you know, starting to come on stream. And I think this is the, you know, this is the the advantage of the, the long term funding, but also one of the one of the challenges that you do need that patience at the outset for the deal to be put in place and for the for the projects to get up and running. And I think, you know, partly because the Glasgow deal was developed at pace um, at the outset. There wasn't quite the same opportunity to do some of the things that the later deals have done in terms of developing the project proposals and building in local support and and going through the kind of local consultation in advance of the deal so in some ways those processes have needed to be um built in since the deal has been agreed um so there's regular um regular discussions between both governments and um and with the deal partners as i said the the partners are in the in the driving seat in terms of um pushing the deal forward and and managing the um managing the projects making sure that they're they're delivering um to scale um and delivering at pace so there's a an assurance framework which is a key key part of that to make sure that the um, you know the internal governance and, and delivery mechanisms are in place um, the gateway review I mentioned um, we have an annual report and annual conversations with each of the um, deal areas in Scotland so that's uh, something that we've just introduced in the past couple of years but it's really helpful in terms of having those conversations bringing all the partners around the table on an annual basis to have a, an open and honest discussion about what the what the challenges are what the opportunities are and also to make sure that the deal is responding to the latest context and we're able to bring in other government sources of um of support and and input um as as the deal is evolving because i think you know clearly these are long-term funding programs and and the economic and other challenges are, are um evolving all the time the um there's a range of structures at a local level with both which go both governments um, join. So the economic delivery group, which I'm sure Richard will talk about, and then the city region partnership as well. Um, so I've got a little bit more information um, about the projects. I think um, you'll you'll probably be familiar with um, with some of these, but the you know the infrastructure side is a is a key. Um, a key plank of the um, of the deal. So there's 21 projects across the city, ranging across roads, bridges, transport infrastructure. Um, some really major projects there that are starting to come on stream, um, and I think you know starting to have quite a transformative impact in in particular areas of the city. And it's been you know it's been really. Good. We talked a bit about this at the um, at the gateway review. You know how how investment from the deal has been able to help unlock 
vacant sites in key locations. So there were, you know, old munitions that had been placed in place in kind of key key locations um, by the Clyde for hundreds of years that we were able to put in that kind of seed investment to, um, through the deal to, to clean up that land and, and make it available for investment, which I think is, you know, it's really positive to see that kind of um, development. The other key um, key area has been innovation and business growth, and I'm sure, you know, some of these projects have, have got off the ground quite quickly. And I'm sure many of you will have will have had the chance to visit places like the Tontine Centre and in Glasgow City Centre, which you know offers opportunities for business incubation and startups. Um, and then the final pillar is skills and employment. Um, so you know, really important. Um, that that goes alongside the other elements and make sure that make sure that local uh, local communities are able to take advantage of all the um, economic opportunities and and you know developing individuals in in low skilled jobs um, to help them up the employment ladder and make sure that they can can access um, opportunities um, and and grow wages. So there's a, a list of all the um, infrastructure um, projects there. I, I won't go through them, but I'm sure um, Richard might want to, to pick out some of them in, in his presentation. But I think, um, yeah, some really, some really exciting developments, things like the Ocean Terminal at um, Inverclyde will be, you know, will be a really big opportunity once that's fully up and running to, to offer a great visitor experience for um, for people coming on cruises to, to Glasgow and should really help to, to open up the um, you know the city region and, and the west of Scotland to, to visitors and give them a really um, good welcome and arrival. And that is the end of um, what I wanted to say so I'll hand over to, to Richard to carry on. Yeah, great. I mean, thanks, thanks very much, Rebecca. As I said, there'll be an opportunity to, to ask questions or raise points in this later, but um, as Rebecca said, it'd be good now to hand over to, to Richard to give us the, the, um, his perspective on, on the deal. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Martin. Um, right, okay. Um, the, f the first thing I should say is it's a pleasure to be here, nice to get the opportunity to do this. Um, rest assured, uh, I'm going to assume these slides are all captured and can be shared, so the one thing you do not have to do is attempt to draw these as I, as I go through them, although you're welcome to try. Um, the, so, so let's just proceed as they say, um, and that's interesting because, yeah, the other thing is, forgive me, what I've discovered is when one's doing this across a Zoom presentation, there is a time lag between pressing next slide and something happening. So if I appear slightly hesitant, that's the reason why oh, I'm not normally hesitant. Anyway, right, Rebecca has already outlined um, some, some facts around the deal, and I think she very diplomatically referred to it as, as being somewhat unique. Um, and that's right, you know, it's the genesis of the Glasgow City deal was slightly different. And that's another fact of Zoom calls once telephone rings. <laughs> so, yes, so, but what you have is something that was fundamentally focused on the delivery of large scale infrastructure, 20 or so large scale infrastructure projects across the city region with a contribution from the UK and Scottish government focused as, as Rebecca has already described. And the objective is to deliver all of those things. Now, what I think is interesting about it is that it, it said the, the city deal was much more specific about the things that would be done as opposed to what would necessarily then happen. And the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is, whilst 1.13 billion sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, um, it's, you know, it's being spent out to 2025. The GVA uplift is anticipated over a 30 year period. Now, as a consequence of that, if you know that the city region's GVA is roughly 43 billion a year, the city deal is actually 0.13 percent. I'll just check my numbers here. The city deal is actually 0.13 percent um, of the GVA of the city region over that period. Now, 
I don't want to suggest in any way that you know we're ungrateful for the funding or that the funding is unwelcome. I think it's simply important to get a sense of scale and a sense of perspective in these things. And it was supposed to deliver and is targeted to deliver a 4% uplift in GVA at the end of, by the end of that period from a baseline at 2018. Now, COVID and more of that later, as they say. But, um, so, <clears throat> the other, one of the other interesting things is <clears throat> that the, the process we went through um, identified the 21 best projects from a long list of nearly three times that many. And one of the interesting phenomena as a result of that whole process was, of course, that you can't have a city region partnership where all of the partners don't get something out of it. That's just where politics meets uh, pragmatism, as it were. And so that is the distribution of projects. That's distribution of projects by number. I don't actually have the distribution of projects by value. I'm sure we could get it. Um, but the other important thing is that part of the selection process for this was seeking to ensure that the projects which, which were funded would be those which had the largest regional impact. And that definition of regional impact was about improving access to employment across the city region. Now, as a consequence of that, quite a lot of this money, well, it's all infrastructure or virtually all infrastructure, and an awful lot of it, because of that, um, because of that requirement, a lot of it is on infrastructure that facilitates movement. And whilst there's nothing wrong with that, one might legitimately ask the question, and Rebecca has made the point about the genesis of this city deal compared to the longer development period for other city deals. One might legitimately ask the question whether if one had had more time and more and broader and wider consultation, whether the composition of that 1.13 billion might have been different. That's simply posing the question. That's not intended to be a criticism of the process or of the outcome. It's simply one can imagine a different outcome if one had taken a different approach. That's all. Um, <clears throat> in relation to that distribution, I think the, the interesting thing is, well, there you go. There is actually the financial distribution that I thought I didn't have. That just tells you something. Um, but it's, it's, it's heavily, heavily infrastructure dominated. And it therefore proceeds on the heroic assumption that investment in infrastructure of itself will generate change. Now, investment in infrastructure does generate change. But it's the extent to which investment in infrastructure will deliver the change that people would like to see across the city region. And again, in terms of development of the city deal, it, is, it talks in broad terms about the uplift in expected in employment. It talks about you know, the uplift in GVA. It is silent on matters of convergence, matters of you know, you know, community development and community engagement. And I think that is less true of successor deals. And that is probably the case because those successor deals have the benefit of looking at the first one and asking them and reflecting on that, you know, and, you know, that again comes as no surprise. You know, the first product in the market, it rarely turns out to be the world beater, iPhones being the exception, I think. Um, so that... So it's simply that's a reflection of the facts. And you can also see that the, in theory, the geographic distribution of the infrastructure projects is across the entire city region, although Western Bartonshire has only one, other places have more. Um, there are a lot of reasons why Western Bartonshire only has one, and I'm happy to explain what those are if anyone's interested. The Employability and Skills Programme is supposed to deliver results across the entirety of the city region. So it is the only one that is region-wide region in scope. And the Innovation and Growth Projects are focused largely around the, the city centre because, well, for a variety of reasons, um, and around the area around Glasgow Airport. Now, again, post-COVID, one wonders. Um, but it, make, you know, it makes perfect sense for the innovation and growth projects 
to be closest to, for instance, the centres of academic excellence that drive the intellectual capital, that drives those innovations and that theoretically then drives that growth. That all makes perfect sense. But what it also means is that the, the, the factual and economic and virtual distance between those innovation projects and the outlying parts of the region, and I mean outlying parts of the region both geographically and economically, is, is significant. And there is nothing in the city deal per se that is designed particularly to spread the benefits of that innovation across all of the city region. Again, not a, not a, not a specific criticism because there are lots of innovation projects in other city regions all over the world who face similar kinds of challenges around how one gets the, the economic benefits from innovation, particularly advanced technological innovation, to deliver benefits across a broader spectrum of the population. That's just a general uh, question. I am not in any way opposed to the fact that we invest in innovation and growth. I think there is an argument, and you'll see this in the Edinburgh City Deal and other successor city deals, that they've actually taken the decision to put more of the available funds into innovation and growth. And again, you know, reasonable argument, you know, some ex post evaluation of any of these city deals will come up with um, conclusions about what they perhaps should or should not have done differently. So now one of the reasons it really matters is that whilst we've got eight participating local authorities, the fact is that the Glasgow city region is, is the functional economic spatial scale for most of the things that one would be interested in if one was trying to grow one's local economy. The, to, to explain this to those of you that aren't necessarily familiar with the area, the Glasgow city is heavily dependent on the less, rest of the city region for some of its key assets. Its labour supply, for instance. The majority of the, the people who work in Glasgow City, particularly in high value jobs, actually commute in from elsewhere. The number of people who commute into Western Bartonshire from the rest of the city region and the number of people who commute out of Western Bartonshire to elsewhere in the city region on any given day are effectively the same. So the, the spatial scale at which the labour market works is fundamentally regional. Now, Glasgow City Region itself is not a perfect match for the travel to work area, but as an example, that's one thing. The vast majority of SMEs in the city region trade within the city region. It's the scale at which the public transport network operates. It's the scale at which the, well, our universities and our further education institutions are almost unique in the UK in terms of the relative percentage of indigenous local students that study in them. They also attract thousands and thousands of international students, but there's an interesting thing about the, the insularity of the city region that, that is relevant to why this is the spatial scale at which one should be seeking to try and make some of these things happen or trying to make change happen. And I think that's, that's fundamentally important and it's why I am a fan of regional economic policy and, and you know deals as one aspect and a subset of that regional economic policy. Because what it's possible for eight individual local authorities to do when they are all interdependent on policies in other places is questionable. The extent to which we can work together and attempt to manage things at the scale at which it actually matters, I think is fundamental to this. And one of the things I wanted to make about the governance point, which I'll come to in a second, is that most of the governance of the city deal in its early days has been around the implementation of the capital programme, around the securing and the implementation of the capital programme, rather than around that city region ambition and governance. But I'll say more about that in a second. For those of you that want to know, it's a largely service-based economy. You can see what, from this information, what the sectors are. A very, very large number of micro-businesses. You know, the city region has got um, relatively few uh, large firms, relatively few high-performing firms. I have to be careful how I phrase that because that's, that's, that's not part of the, the sort of popular promotional narrative, but it's a fact. Um, and, you know, and across the city region, we have got significant issues with 
you know, long-term unemployment, um, ill health, morbidity, a whole range of things like that. So, and the extent to which the city deal is focused on solving those particular problems is, is, is not clear. You know, there, there is a, an assumption that the investment in infrastructure will cause things to happen, which will cause other things to happen, which will solve some of these under, other underlying problems. Relatively little beyond the employability initiatives is targeted specifically on some of those underlying problems. Again, not a criticism of the deal per se, simply an observation and, and simply a fact. Now, I mentioned governance. The, the governance for, of the city deal is um, robust, you know, is it is extremely well codified. Um, it has been subject to uh, very significant levels of scrutiny, both during its um, development and subsequently during its implementation. And that's all good. And it has come up with a clean bill of health, uh, you know, every time at all times of asking. So it is robust. However, it is far from simple, as you can see. And the, one of the things that's underway at the moment is an exercise with the, the city that's about to go to the city region cabinet to ask ourselves the question whether or not this is now fit for purpose, whether this can be simplified, whether it can be made more efficient. And also, I suppose now one of the questions has to be the extent to which it rec recognises and reflects the challenges that we currently face. Um, if I was to give you an example, I probably, uh, of all of those diagrams, I probably attend one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those fora in an average sort of, you know, working cycle. Um, and I meet all the same people um, at all seven. I will meet some other people as well, but just, you know, there is a question around that. Um, and there is a question around the extent to which this is focused on ensuring that we deliver on the bargain that has been struck with the UK and Scottish governments, which is an absolutely fundamental and an absolutely essential that we do that, and the extent to which it does more than that. The extent to which, if you like, we capitalise on both the capital investment and on the organisational investment that has been made. So. I'm going to move on for a moment and just talk briefly about, and very briefly about COVID. And the, the, we've done a bit of analysis. One of the most successful things in my view in the city region is we've created a city region intelligence hub with the Fraser of Allender Institute that allows us and is now getting to a position where we can get really extremely good economic analysis at the city region level, which was not previously possible. And one of the virtues of that is that, that most of that analysis can be then disaggregated to the local authority level. And the authorities themselves would never have been in the position to produce that kind of information. And for instance, what it allows us to do is look at the impacts of COVID thus far, and known thus far, on the city region. Which sectors are most likely to be affected? What is the city region's representation in relation to those sectors? What does that potentially mean? And one of the other questions I think around this, if you think about it based on what we already know, you know, there is a presumption that we've got 21 in the main large infrastructure projects. Given what has happened over the last four months, there now has to be a perfectly legitimate question about the extent to which we can deliver these on time, on budget, or in some cases, if at all. And there also has to be a question about projects that were developed in a different time, um, whether these now remain or whether the expectations of what they were going to deliver now remain valid. Now, if we take the, the example that Rebecca gave, the Ocean Terminal, which I would agree at the time when we appraised that, that's a great project. That's a great project that was designed to um, allow the city region to extract as much value as possible from tourists using a particular mode of travel to come to the city region. That's great. That makes perfect sense. Except that the mode of travel was cruise ships. And now no one could have envisaged what has happened to that particular industry as a consequence of COVID. But I think it would be reasonable to say that the previous assumptions about the rate of growth in that market and the previous assumptions about 
the level of uh, visitor spend as a consequence of that market that would accrue from Ocean Terminal probably have to be revisited. I would say no more than that. And what the, the, the sort of aggregate impact of those kinds of changes does to the city deal's ability to meet its GVA uplift target and its other targets, again, now has to be revisited. I would also argue the completion dates and costs probably have to be revisited. But in that respect, we're no different from everybody else in the world, frankly. Um, but it's, it's just a fact. So <clears throat> there are some facts about the sheer numbers of people um, in the city region who are affected by COVID thus far. And these are, you know, these are the economic effects. You know, we know about, and you get you, those of you that do that watch these things, we see regular bulletins about the health effects. We know less about the social effects, but we have good information now about the nature of the economic effects. And one of the questions, one of the things that we're working on now in the intelligence unit and across this, the certainly the officer level of the city region governance structures, is exactly what a city region scale COVID res recovery response ought to look like. Um, and that's something I'm perfectly happy to discuss. In fact, I'd welcome other people's views on what we think that needs to look like. Um, but there are the potential projections across Glasgow City Region, if you haven't seen them before, about what we think the potential unemployment scenarios are. And on that basis, you can see how it would be legitimate to ask ourselves at this point, what more do we do through those governance structures and around the investment that we already know is going to happen to try and lower that peak and shorten that timeline, if at all possible. And within that, there's also a question about what we do to try and ensure that the impacts of COVID to particular parts of the population, demographically and geographically, is kept to the absolute minimum possible. Because the power to do that doesn't lie with individual local authorities. It certainly doesn't. So that's something that's occupying our time uh, quite a lot at the moment. And there is our heat map, as it were, for now, of where we think the likely coronavirus uh, risks are highest across what we know to be the composition of the industry base in the Glasgow City region. And those are the sectors, again, a, a sort of geographical heat, or a graphical heat map of where we think the greatest risks potentially lie. And we are now in a position, incidentally, although I don't have it here, to map the sectoral and demographic information across all of these at the city region and sub-city region local authority level and lower. So we are able now to make forecasts rather than predictions of what we think the impact will be on different people in different places. And we're able to update that as and when new data sets become available, which is only one of the things that the intelligence hub is able to do. One of many, I have to say. So, <clears throat> in terms of what we think all this means, there is, at the moment, our thinking about what we would do in terms of a COVID recovery. Questions rather than answers. But where we think we're going to have to try to focus and where, if we, for instance, were to find ourselves with money coming back from the existing city deal projects because some of them didn't happen, or if future public investment was being channeled through the city region governance process, those are the emerging areas that we think we would probably want to try and use that money. But this has not yet been through any cabinet process or anywhere else. It's simply where we're, our thinking currently takes us. So hopefully you found all of that reasonably useful. Um, and I think that was roughly the 20 minutes. I probably missed several things that I did want to say, um, but I'm happy to join the discussion now. So thank you, Martin. Great, great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Richard. No, thanks for to both the presenters for um, keeping the time and giving us um, such interesting um, material. Um, I'd like to open the discussion up, um, invite questions, responses um, to the presentations we've heard. 
perhaps we could do it in a couple of rounds, um, just not so we don't overload Richard and um, Rebecca. And for the first round, I'd like to take advantage of my position and, and maybe make a couple of quick comments or uh, and a question, and then perhaps I'll hand over to um, Sergin Passos Vidal from the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, who I know has a question, and then also uh, Roberto Rocco from TU Delft, um, where EPRC also has a base. But in terms of, of my, my points, I mean, I, I think I, I take from this the value and the, the, you know, how potentially crucial the, the deal is in terms of providing longer term funding, including strategic projects, focusing on these linkages in the urban area, the functional urban area, um, and also incentivizing cooperation across um, national and local jurisdictions. Um, we see these similar approaches in other uh, European countries, but also cohesion policy under, under the, the EU, where we have sustainable urban development strategies, integrated territorial investments and so on, that match some of these principles. We also see the challenges um, there, that, which both presentations have, have touched on to an extent. So in terms of coordination, um, capacity and, and building consensus. My question is um, for, is, is specifically about the, the coordination um, question. Obviously, as Rebecca said, we're talking about a tripartite system um, with local authorities and the UK and Scottish governments. And I think maybe we can, we can see in the context of Brexit that there are different emphases emerging across these different jurisdictions about what economic development policy should do. Um, so for instance, in terms of the emphasis on social or economic or environmental points, about the type of investments or funding instruments that should be used. I'm just wondering, particularly in the context of, of COVID, um, where pressure will be on to make decisions and prioritise. Um, a specific question to, to both Richard and Rebecca from the perspectives is, how, how do they see, how effective are these governance or coordination mechanisms? And looking forward, are they in a position to cope with the pressures that are likely to come um, under the COVID, uh, uh, the, the COVID context? Um, as I said, R R Richard mentioned some of the, the structures that are in place there. Um, are, 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 they, are these coordination mechanisms um, fit for purpose going forward? I suppose would be the, the, the question I would ask. Um, before I get a response, could I hand over to, to Seraphine to, to, to come in um, and make any points or questions? Uh, thank you, Martin. I mean, I, 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 I think you almost uh, stole my question because, uh, as you can imagine, for, for a number of reasons, I'm uh, very, always very keen on looking at the governance arrangements and the politics of, 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 of the policies. Of the policies. So, but I will complement the question because um, uh, instead, I mean, um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, in, in a way where, where this has been developed, uh, this model in Scotland is, is very novel in the way that we have a very multi-level uh, arrangement that was not uh, the template for suddenly uh, during the evolution is a new way of working. Uh, um, it, it also because it's is, it almost developed organically from uh, you know, a scheme that started in England, then it was, you know, adopted in, in Glasgow and then has been evolved uh, in different ways across, across Scotland. So it's a very, in a way, it's very new and some other things are back to the future of things that perhaps existed before, for instance, as you, as, as, as Martin inferring in cohesion policy. So my question is more, uh, if you could elaborate more about the issue of policy learning uh, in terms of how, how we can ensure that the lessons are learned and they can communicate it to the other city deals, uh, uh, as the deals evolve, also in terms of ensuring consistency between uh, plans that are being developed quite organically um, with wider strategies at uh, UK or in this case Scottish level, so just to make sure, it's a bit complementing what Martin said, not just the governance, but the consistency and the capacity and policy learning, how can be ensured that this is sustained over time, uh, 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 given the, the organic nature of the initial start of the, of the deals themselves. Thank you. Thanks, Seraphine. Um, I wonder if I could ask Roberto if, if he has um, a, a question he would like to. Yes, yes. I, I. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I, uh, my name is Roberto. I'm an associate professor in spatial planning here at TU Delft, and uh, 
because I'm not in the UK, so I have a couple of very naive questions, and I hope you, you forgive me for that, uh, since we are, I'm not so familiar with uh, how things work in the UK. But you mentioned the deals are, uh, the, the street uh, parties uh, deals, but I wonder uh, how do the, uh, are you in competition with other local authorities in Scotland and how does this work? Um, uh, uh, I wonder what happens with the local authorities that have very, very uh, uh, low capacity to make these deals. How do they, do they perform? And I think my, my other question was, uh, so I was, sent the, the, I was sent the presentation beforehand. I was looking at the presentation and I was thinking, wow, this looks so amazing. This is a coordination overall policy um, in some circles, one hears the, the expression urban reform. And, um, you know, I don't know what urban reform really is, but I was, I was thinking, wow, this looks like, a, you know, a tool for ur urban reform. But I noticed that um, uh, you, didn't, you didn't emphasize in your presentations the roles of uh, a civil society and citizen engagement. And I, I think I saw that in the presentation, but uh, in the governance structure that you explained, it was not so so uh, evident. So I'm I'm curious about that. Great, thanks, thanks very much, Roberto. Um, so can I can I ask um, Rebecca and Richard to re respond to those those first set of of, of questions and, and, and comments, and then perhaps we can come back for to pick up any others. And um, Rebecca, do you want to, to go first? Thanks. Yeah, really, um, really interesting questions and a, a lot to discuss. Um, so just in terms of um, your questions, um, Martin, on the kind of coordination mechanisms and, and structures and, and leading into to seraphins. I mean, I think um, I think there are good coordination mechanisms in place. I think these um, you know, we've seen these developing across Scotland because these regional structures hadn't previously existed. So as you said, we're, we're encouraging that regional cooperation um, and structures have been developed to, to support that. So I think the regional economic partnerships are really key um, from my perspective. And that's a really helpful, I suppose, I think the challenge is shifting from the kind of um, the, the kind of project and program approach and then linking that into the, the bigger strategic picture. And I think from the UK government perspective, this is something that, that we, we hear from local areas is that they're really keen to, to plug into that bigger strategic picture. You know, what is the, what is the kind of shape of policy um, direction for, um, in both governments on, on the big kind of economic challenges? And I think these regional economic partnerships are the place where we can have some of those conversations. Conversations, because I think the the city deals program, you know, it's very. We are having some of those strategic discussions at an early stage, and I suppose this is this is where some of the other deal areas have had the time in a sense that Glasgow didn't. So if I think about the islands, I mentioned, you know, we're we're on the the path to agreeing a deal there. Um, those are maybe areas that, that haven't had quite the, um, the same capacity as some of the, the larger local authorities. And, you know, on the UK government side, we've been bringing them down to Whitehall to have early discussions with the key departments so they can tap into that kind of strategic thinking. Um, so, you know, for example, they can understand what the direction of energy policy and, and the green economy is in Bayes and, and, and know how they can shape their project proposals to, to fit into that bigger strategic picture. But I think the, we have an element of that at the, at the kind of development stage of the deals, but the challenge is keeping that going as, as the, the situation is evolving. And that's partly what we do through the annual conversations and through these regional economic partnerships. But I think it's still quite a patchwork. If you look at the regional economic partnerships, they vary quite a lot across Scotland. You know, as UK government, we're invited to some of them, but not all of them. And I think there is, there is further to go in terms of regional economic development in Scotland and how we make sure that there are kind of the right structures in place in all areas to be able to to provide the right connectivity in terms of policy making and strategic thinking between the different levels of governance. Thanks. 
So I think it's a, it's a kind of, we're on the way there, but there's, there's further to go would be my, um, my assessment. And similarly on, on lessons learned, I think there's been a lot of informal sharing of best practice and experience from, from area to area. You know, I suppose that's the benefit of the, the scale of Scotland, that there are good connections at a range of levels and we've been able to, to link up areas that where we think they can benefit from, from each other's experience. There's now kind of more formal networks um, developing amongst the programme management offices. So I think that um, that sharing of sharing of best practice is happening more um, and we we have sought to formalize that and we're still we're still on that journey I mean I think you um, you referred to the fact that these have um, have developed in quite a kind of organic way so things like monitoring and evaluation for example I mean as as Richard said there's quite a you know a, a thorough structure being put in place in Glasgow because of the nature of that deal but for other deals we've been involving the monitoring and evaluation as we're going and for example Edinburgh um, has put in a lot of work to that that we're now seeking to share across other areas as best practice and as a kind of template to to draw on so I think again it's it's a, a work in pro progress but there is there is more to do um, and I think yeah the capacity question is a very good one because we do see that you know that really varies across local authorities um, I mean, I think it's it has been a very interesting experience. I've been in this role for two and a half years, so I've seen some of that kind of, um, you know, the, there is a bit of jostling amongst the different areas in Scotland in terms of what the sequencing is between the different deals. Um, I mean, you know, clearly there's an element of, of, you know, kind of who came first with their asks and, and was able to develop them more quickly. Um, you know, some areas have been frustrated by the, by the pace of progress and would have liked to be able to go more quickly. Um, you know, there's quite a complex um, mechanism on the UK government side. You know, the Scotland office doesn't have the resources to be able to commit to these deals. We have to negotiate internally on the UK government side and um, with the Scottish government for both both to agree the kind of uh, the timelines and uh, sequencing. So, so there is, you know, there is quite a lot in that space and we've seen, you know, the deals are overlapping even as well. So an area... Um, like uh, Fife, you know, is in more than one um, deal and, you know, you have seen some some areas facing choices about which deal they would go into, you know, should um, Falkirk could have gone in with Tay Cities, but I think there were, you know, historical and, and other questions about whether, whether that was the best option. So I think um, sometimes you have seen central government, I know from, from colleagues um, in England that they have sometimes, you know, given quite a strong push to areas to come together. But I think um, in Scotland, we have left it to local areas to, to form their own um, partnerships and, and, and make their choices about where they wanted to, um, to partner with other areas. But there's, there's definitely been um, a, a bit of kind of, uh, yeah, quite a lot of questions at the, at the kind of national political and, and local politics in, in the mix there. And then I think, yeah, capacity has definitely been a, a challenge in, in some of the smaller local authorities where they haven't got substantial kind of economic development departments. Um, I think that's probably increasingly the case as we've, if we've, as we've moved to more rural areas. And it's probably been a particular challenge um, on the UK government side. As I said, we're investing a lot in things like research and innovation and um, digital infrastructure and not all areas, particularly some of the smaller, more rural ones have, have been able to find projects easily. So we've had to take different approaches there. Um, Scottish Enterprise has been helping some of the local areas. So the, you know, the National Economic Development um, agency has been working with some of the smaller authorities to help them um, and then we have actually kind of put funds in place in, in Angus for example we weren't able to find projects at the heads of term stage um, to invest in, um, in in the right kinds of areas so we, we gave them a bit more time um, to develop those. Um, I'll maybe let Richard 
um, comment on the, the citizen engagement piece in more detail, but I think it, it is an area of importance from, from both governments' perspectives. And I think it's, you know, it's something that other deals have, have been able to learn from Glasgow and, and devote more time to that as the deal was developing. But I think it is something that is a really important element because I think probably if you, if you look at the deal program, program across Scotland, there is more that we can do to make sure that the, there is kind of public awareness of it and the, you know, the opportunities are seen as benefiting all rather than specific sectors of the economy. Um, and I think they're, you know, it's really important that they're, they're managed in, a, in an open way um, and bringing in the, the full range of partners. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Thanks very much, Rebecca, for those responses. Can, can I ask Richard to, to take over? Uh, Richard, you should un unmute. Sorry, I thought I had. Right. Anyway, right. Thank you, Martin. Uh, well done, Rebecca. Good answers. Um, the, I'll attempt to answer the questions in the order in which they were asked. Um, how fit are the governance structures for the problem that we face? It doesn't matter. They're the governing structures that we have. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, and you know, were we to take the time to try and invent new ones, um, I have no doubt that the crisis that we face would uh, show us absolutely no mercy and continue to get worse where we uh, indulged in trying to come up with different ones. I think the point is that the structures have to remain the same because of what they have. What they talk about and what they focus their attention on has to change and is in the process of changing. Um, we'll be taking reports to the city region cabinet about you know, a city region level recovery plan and so on. So I think that's it's simply a practical fact. You know, it would be nothing short of miraculous and extraordinary and very odd if a, you know, a, a structure that was originally established to ensure the efficient delivery of 21 infrastructure projects was a perfect fit for a global economic crisis. That would come as a surprise. Um, so the, in terms of um, how we share the lessons, Rebecca's already said there are, there are all manner of informal um, structures of one sort or another. I'm not on the city deal PMO, though I have a very close relationship with them. But I do know that there are, you know, there are significant amounts of time spent sharing information across those different program management offices. You know, whether that is a two-way street given the, the fact that the Glasgow one is first most mature um, is, is, is a different question. I think what we might get in Glasgow is by looking at the, the, the sort of um, the, the younger programmes as it were, one might ask yourself the question, what might we do next based on what we've seen them do based on what we told them in the first place? I think there's something around that that we, would, that we do have to capitalise on. The capacity question is interesting. Um, this isn't my day job, you know, you know, working on the city region, city deal isn't my day job at all. You know, I've got a very large department to run <laughs> in a very poor council. Um, and the, the, but the only way to do this is because I think the likelihood of one ever creating a separate level of kind of regional capability where there isn't a statutory regional governance body um, I think that that's never going to happen. So this has to be a kind of collegiate effort and that has both advantages and limitations. The advantage is that everyone sat around the table has detailed knowledge of a particular part of the, the, the regional geography. Uh, the disadvantage is that that's the primary focus and it's, it is genuinely challenging for people to step away and think regionally people can do it, but it is challenging. And their first responsibility and their first priority is in a, inescapably back to the people who actually pay their wages. So, so that, that's just a fact of, fact of life. Um, and the, are we in competition with other local authorities? Well, yes and no. Within the city deal, the allocation of the money has now taken place. So we're not in competition for the money. Um, and the challenge is to put in place a set of mechanisms such that any competition for resources takes place in a framework 
where the criteria by which those resources are allocated is well understood, transparent and, and evidence-based. As long as you have that, then the challenge is for everyone to come up with the best possible project, not win the argument. Um, and so we need, we need mechanisms that allow us to do that. Um, are we in competition for economic growth? Actually, less so, I would say. The advantage of a city region level programme is that the city region as a whole presents a better economic prospectus and a better economic proposition than any individual part of the city region does. So there is certainly, you know, strength in numbers there. Um, in terms of and urban reform, yes, yes. Do I think the city region or city deal level governance structures represent a potential mechanism for urban reform? Yes, absolutely. In fact, it is the thing that keeps me most interested is the potential for us managing the, the urban realm at an appropriate scale. Do we do it yet? No. And the reason we don't do it yet is because there is no formal regional governance structure and there are no formal powers to do that. But it does at least create a chamber where that kind of dialogue and that shared thinking can take place. And as we move to developing the next iteration of the regional economic strategy, it will have a very clear spatial dimension. And it will say very clear things about the, how we see the, the urban realm in all its aspects developing in future. So that I think is very true. Um, I think that the, the involvement of civil society is an interesting one because when one pursues the advantages of, you know, spatial scale in regional governance, one of the things that becomes ever harder to do is identify who the community actually is. And it's, so one ends up having to find proxies for these things and, or one has to try and identify where there are common interests and develop policies that will address what you think are common problems or seize opportunities that are of the benefit to identifiable communities and populations. I think the suggestion that there is such a thing for argument's sake as a business representative for the city region is, is highly questionable, um, far less a community representative for the city region. So, and I, th I think that's a challenge that faces everyone. Um, Having said that, you know, we are responsible to a cabinet that has the leaders of all of the councils and they are the elected representatives of those populations. So at an absolute minimum, we already have democratic representation on the city deal and everything the city deal and the city region government structure does is accountable to those people. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. I think we still have, we still have time for a, a couple of other questions and I noticed that um, John, John Backler and, and David, um, David Webster have, have indicated they, they would like to, to raise some points. So can I, can I ask John first and then David? Thanks Martin and, and thank you uh, both Rebecca and Richard for um, really interesting stimulating presentations and also the points you've made in the in response to the, uh, to the questions. I did have a question for Rebecca on the her take on the added value of the UK government's role um, in the uh, in in the, in the deal. And the, the, but uh, I think you've, you've you've addressed many of those points in terms of the uh, the knowledge sharing, um, particularly and access to uh, the government departments that uh, that particularly local authorities wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so I'd like to focus on the, the, the issue that you, Richard, um, touched on uh, towards the end, and that is uh, spatial, spatial focus of intervention. If I understood your presentation um, correctly, and also the, some of the points Rebecca was, made, made, was making, the key advantage uh, that um, the deal has brought is a region-wide focus, if essentially filling a strategic gap um, that had perhaps disappeared with um, the abolition of Strathclyde Region and other structures like the West of Scotland European European Partnership, and that it was enabling that it enables um, a, a strategic focus, and that you've got a governance 
model that works um, in several respects. It's so clearly over complex in some, in some areas and so on, as you mentioned, but essentially um, there is a, a, a regional partnership that, uh, that, that works and has increasingly got the evidence base um, to inform the way it works. Um, but in, in your question, um, what would have been done differently? You focused on the two of the aspects that have just been talked about. One is um, a more refined spatial focus in terms of guidance for investment decisions and a community, a community involvement. And you came back to that towards the end of your presentation um, when you were looking at some of the, the longer term directions. Um, um, and one of those was for a more place-based policy approach. Um, now, really what that means is disputed in the academic and, and, and policy literatures. Um, and it can be interpreted very flexibly as perhaps it, it, it should be given that it, it means different things for different policy areas. But uh, I wonder what you think that actually means in, in practice. Um, taking what you said just now a stage further. Um, yes, we've got local authorities on the board, uh, on the cabinet, um, but local authorities are huge constructs in, in parts of Scotland with very, very diverse areas within them. Um, given the need for flexibility, which you also mentioned, given that you have um, increasingly spatially disaggregated insights into where the problems are. What should we be thinking about in terms of making place-based policy a reality? Is the, I mean, maybe the current city deal governance structure is adequate for that. Or do you see that we need a further dimension, a more localized uh, dimension in terms of, uh, of how we respond to these, these challenges? Thanks, John. If we take take the question from from David, and then we can ask um, ask for responses to to, to those two interventions. So, David, please. Well, well my question is for Rebecca. Um, she talked about the um, fact that the Glasgow program was thrown together rather hurriedly at the outset. Now, of course, um, the largest single project is the Glasgow Airport Rail Link and um, this has obviously been in trouble for years um, because all of the proposals have either not provided much connectivity um, or they've had carried a, a very serious interchange penalty which means that they were not likely to be used by very many people. However, we have recently had the Glasgow Connectivity Commission, which has put forward the proposal that the underground should be extended from Govan. Now that seems to me, and I've been following this issue for at least 25 years, because I used to work for Glasgow City Council. This is the only project which actually both uh, provides serious connectivity all around the city, in particular to the West End, Buchanan Street and so on, and uh, also doesn't carry an interchange penalty for certainly a lot of the people who would use it. Now, um, it does seem to me that this has got to be seriously looked at, but from what I've been able to find out, there is actually uh, next to nothing taking place in the way of discussion between the uh, people like yourselves um, in this in the Scottish government and the uh, UK government and um, people in and around the uh, connectivity commission itself or the city council or whatever so obviously the question about the underground extension project is how much it would cost um, it does seem to me that, I mean, that is, that is what cities do to provide connectivity to their airports. You can see cities all over the world uh, currently working on it. For instance, Dulles Airport in, in uh, Washington, that's what they're doing. 
that's what people do so why aren't we doing it um and why and what sort of discussions are taking place and if they're not then what's going to be done about setting them up thank you okay thanks david so it's a, a specific question for for rebecca um, first and then maybe uh, finish with um richard's response to, to john's broader broader question Thanks. Um, no, I mean the airport um, link is a is a very interesting um, and and complex um, project and and one that has a has a long history. I think which you're um, alluding to. I mean, I think um, it is one that we we have discussed regularly with the partners when we have the um, you know the the range of governance structures we've talked about. We're going through the you know the series of um, of projects at all of the different levels and and focusing in on on the ones with particular issues so i think the um you know the the glasgow airport link has come up um in in all of our discussions at the it was um touched on at the um at the gateway review that we did earlier in the year and at the last annual conversation and we'll at the uh, at the next one as well um clearly the um you know the Scottish government is having constant discussions with um, with local partners and and you know national agencies on all of the the transport um, questions and and this is kind of seen within that context. But I think from from both governments' perspectives, um, we've been really keen um, that the the local partners have the right mechanisms in place to to make these decisions about um about the projects and how they need to to adapt or, or flex to to changing circumstances so i think it's really that process that um that richard referred to in terms of making sure that there um there are you know clear criteria and and mechanisms in place um for projects to be reviewed because clearly over a 20-year program not everything that was originally in the in the deal is necessarily going to remain in the deal i think there's you know there's probably a question to be to be had and for the for the partners to consider based on the you know i know the the, the findings of the connectivity commission will be um being considered by the partners and i think you know both governments are, are ready to to discuss at the appropriate moment what the you know what the right pathway is in terms of how that project should fit into the deal and whether um you know whether the the kind of funding envelope in the deal is sufficient whether a, other funding needs to be brought in alongside that i mean i think that's that's all to be considered i think in you know in our previous discussions with partners that that kind of consideration was still ongoing so i don't think we've 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 reached that kind of decision point yet um but i think you know that is something that um that will need to be looked at carefully and, and we'll be keen to keen to have that discussion with the partners at the appropriate moment. Thanks, Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, if, if I could ask Richard to come in, I mean, John's question about the, the place-based um, model and how that may mm. look. Thank you, Martin. Have I unmuted myself successfully this time? Excellent. I'm really glad I didn't have to deal with the question about the airport rail link. Um, Phew. Right. Okay. So, yes, spatial strategies. Uh, the first thing to say is that we have been working on this because uh, the Glasgow City Region Cabinet uh, approved and submitted a submission to the Scottish Government's um, consultation on the National Planning Framework in June uh, around exactly what we thought a spatial strategy for the City Region should be, not in enormous detail, um, but exactly what we thought that should be. And I'll I'll, I'll give you some snippets from this because I've managed to find it while Rebecca was answering that other question. And it, it says the following things. It says that we think some of the important policy drivers are support for a placemaking approach, priority on regeneration and compact cities, um, and the reuse of vacant and derelict land. Supporting sustainable connectivity, especially in relation to active travel and modal shift. Um, delivering surface water management, uh, delivery of the green network. There's a proposal for a Glasgow City Region green network, which you may or may not have seen. Um, delivering new housing based on a regional approach to housing need and demand. 
is what it says, right? And what we're trying to do is minimize carbon and development footprint, um, maximize regeneration and renewal through the use of vacant and derelict land, um, put in place policies that um, favor uh, climate change adaption and mitigation, deliver inclusive growth, improve environmental quality, and provide sustainable connectivity, including active travel. So there's a focus, if you like, at that level. Now, and that's the proposal that has gone in from the city region. And I think it's a good one, frankly. Um, I think those are the right things. In addition to that, we have also made a submission which specifically talks about a thing called Mission Clyde and the need for a focus on the economic potential of the river. And the, the, through the city region process, we have identified 14 projects. I think it's 14 from account that we think should be the physical Mission Clyde projects. And I'm pleased to say Western Berkshire has got four of those. We might only have one city deal project, but we've got four out of the 14 Mission Clyde ones because we've got lots of waterfront. Um, um, I should say in, in relation to that, the objectives there are to reconnect the communities along and across the Clyde, um, recycle, reuse and remediate vacant and derelict land, um, support increased development densities, more and less space, um, Frank put, and generate large scale economic activity, large scale economic activity that can extract competitive advantage from its proximity to the river. So that's roughly what that says. Um, now, what we've now got to do, of course, uh, is we've then got to come up with a next iteration of a city region economic strategy that embodies those principles. And then as a consequence of that, one would expect to see projects brought forward that addressed those issues and delivered on those. And so the job of the region, if you like, is to understand what the, the challenges are, set a prioritization framework, and then let the local authorities and their consultation processes come up with the kinds of projects that address those issues. And I think that's, that's a sound methodology. And I think that the, the spatial planning approach, that has, the spatial approach that has been proposed does truly reflect both the issues that are common across the city region and the opportunities for that. And they also, incidentally, when you, even if you look at them now, you can see how, by happy coincidence, these are to an extent, um, COVID aware is the phrase I'm going to use. Um, you know, sustainable local neighborhoods, you know, no one said it in any of the documents, but the creation of the 20 minute neighborhood, that kind of thinking is is likely to be what emerges from this process. So that's that's my answer such as it is. The, the question around whether there should be more local structures is, well, it's caught up in the fact that, you know, the regional governance structures are, you know, they are not established by statute as it were. So we, I think we have to rely for that on the, the, the local consultative processes that each of the authorities is responsible for and runs. Not because I think they're necessarily perfect, um, but because I can't at the moment see any path to the creation of an alternative set of local consultation structures that would likely to be, that would, would actually be likely to be implemented. That's simply my view. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Richard. Um, I realise we're now running out of time again towards towards the end of our uh, slot, so um, I don't see any other questions from 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 our participants. In that case, um, I'd just like to thank uh, Rebecca and thank Richard for their presentations and for their responses to the, the points raised and to, to the particip other participants for having, I think it's been a an active and, and really interesting debate on what I think is a really important issues. And I hope this has been relevant for, for everyone for everyone taking part. So thanks again everybody and um, yeah also to note the the there the will be a recording of the of the, the webinar available on the EPRC uh, website. So it's something that people can 
can catch up on um, too. So thank you very much. Um, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thanks everyone.